Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to talk about SASE and specifically SD-WAN and remote access and how SD-WAN and remote access are changing the way our users connect to our networks. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy. I'm a vice president at ARG and while I work for ARG, this video is my own and doesn't necessarily reflect the views and opinions of my employer. This channel is all about helping IT leaders understand the business value of some of the new technologies that are available to them today. Let's talk about how SASE and in particular SD-WAN and remote access are changing the way IT organizations are providing access to remote users. So we're going to talk about very quickly what SASE is, what SD-WAN is, and what remote access is. Just one, one slide page on a definition of those. And then specifically we're going to talk about why remote access should be a focus of your organization moving forward. We're going to compare and contrast SD-WAN and remote access and talk about why they're really two approaches solving the same problem. We're going to talk about how the platforms will eventually merge and then we're going to provide some buying tips on what you need to look out for when you're looking at a remote access platform. Let's get into it. Let's quickly define some terms. Now I have videos on these. I'm going to put some video links in the description of this video so you can go off and get more information on some of these topics. So we're just going to have one or two bullets on each of these, uh, each of these terms. So SASE, Secure Access Service Edge. It's essentially delivering a security posture and network performance to your end users no matter where they are, no matter what device they want to be using. So it's a, it's a way of bringing control, bringing uh, uh, governance to and performance to your end users no matter where they are in the world. SD-WAN, Software Defined Wide Area Network, now I don't like this description. It's already a little archaic. First of all, Wide Area Network. Uh, you don't need a Wide Area Network to implement an SD-WAN uh, capability. We have a lot of single site customers in our practice that benefit tremendously from the SD-WAN capabilities. Also, software defined. I think it was software defined five years ago when this term was coined, but now I think it's more cloud defined, especially in a SASE framework. It's really about allowing the cloud to figure out the best way of delivering traffic to, um, to your users and back to the applications that they're trying to access. Now, SD-WAN traditionally includes security, application prioritization, enhanced quality of service for corporate connectivity, and a bunch of management benefits. Again, I'm not going to go into the details here, but a bunch of man management benefits for the IT organization for governance and control. This, the SD-WAN story is really about edge consolidation, bringing all of those services that you used to have a separate appliance for into one platform. Now, security has not traditionally been a part of the SD-WAN story. A lot of people purchase SD-WAN uh, and do not implement a security strategy through that platform. But I will say increasingly, customers are looking for a unified SD-WAN platform that does include a strong security component. Remote access. Now, that's our traditional VPN. That's how end users, remote workers, mobile workers get back to the network securely. It's really about individual access to corporate connectivity traditionally. Now, SD-WAN, as you might have noticed, and remote access have significant overlap. They're both about delivering the same promise. SD-WAN has a lot more capabilities because it's generally appliance-based, and so it has uh, a compute plane that can provide a lot more functionality. But as we move into a SASE model where the compute is hosted in the cloud, remote access is gaining more and more of those capabilities. And I want to encourage you to start thinking of the user, the end user, as your edge rather than some physical location at an office or in a data center. Now, why do I believe remote access is so important at the moment? I just think that many organizations had deferred upgrading their VPN in the hopes that most of their organization would return back to the office. I personally feel as if that's not going to happen. I think we're going to have a hybrid work environment where people are cycling through an office periodically but doing a lot of work from home for the foreseeable future. So I know a lot of people signed new licensing agreement to upgrade their VPN capacity over the last year and so they really haven't been in a financial position to do anything about it. Now that some of those licenses are beginning to expire, it's time to start exploring a remote access strategy that works for the way that we compute today. Most people have had their traditional VPN access strategy in place for at least 10 years, and it hasn't changed that much. But the way we compute, the way your end users 
access corporate information has changed dramatically. So it's time to stop deferring this remote access decision, and it's time to upgrade a, into a remote access strategy that supports how you work today. And that includes being able to access cloud environments, your SaaS applications that are hosted by a third party someplace uh, outside of your control, and of course, secure remote access into your core network for applications and resources that reside there. Okay, so we need to up our game in remote access. Well, what does that look like? Here are some of the keys that I would include when I'm evaluating your next remote access solution. Number one is we want the remote access solution to prioritize or to uh, evolve from an endpoint application to an end user application. Recall that we talked about having or visualizing the end user as the edge now. It's not necessarily a device, it is the user. We want a remote access to include a couple of things. Of course, it's going to uh, ensure threat protection uh, through encryption and, and, and so forth. That's kind of table stakes for a remote access solution. It should conduct a basic evaluation of the endpoint from which it's originating. So uh, what's the current malware, uh, anti-malware, antivirus situation on that device? Is it up and running? What's the patch and upgrade status? Is it coming from an IP address that I'm familiar with? Those types of things. It should provide access to a variety of networks, not just back to your corporate network. We want it to work on a variety of devices, including personal devices. This is the um, entire bring your own device, BYOD uh, construct, where people want to be able to use whatever device they choose. If someone is going on vacation, do they need to bring their personal tablet and their corporate laptop to the beach? Probably not. Let's give them the ability to work from that personal device in a secure manner while they're, uh, while they're on vacation, for example. Now, it's important that the device flexibility does not come with an additional cost. So there are a couple consumption models for uh, remote access, and some is just direct per device licensing. Well, if you're going to give people the flexibility to put it on their personal devices, that can get crazy expensive very quickly. So we want a different consumption model if that's going to be your strategy. Something where an individual user license provides up to, let's say, three or five licenses within that, within that individual user license so they can deploy it on multiple devices. Or something that's more focused on throughput because that won't change depending upon the number of devices that are, that are being deployed or engaged by the particular end user. We want it to, it to support integration with your existing tooling, especially for multi-factor authentication and single sign-on. We want it to have adaptive rules and permissions based upon the context of the request. So there are some elements of zero trust that are going to be brought in here. Like, is this a, a typical um, uh, access profile for this user, or is it coming from a different IP address at a different time of day from a different device? And maybe we should deploy some, dish, uh, some additional rules around that access request versus one that uh, happens five days a week. We want it to focus on the user and what is being accessed and where the data is migrating. Those are the key elements that should be incorporated in your remote access solution. We want it to accelerate traffic over a private backbone. Since we're talking about distributed workforces now, you may have users anywhere trying to access applications that live in a very finite location. We don't want those users to go over the public internet for all of their access. If we can bring that traffic into a private network supported by the remote access vendor, then that uh, traffic can be accelerated and give it an MPLS-like uh, quality of service over that middle mile to improve the end user's overall experience. And then to take advantage of that middle mile, we want a broadly distributed access strategy from the remote access provider. So we want them to have access nodes onto that private backbone that are broadly distributed around the globe, or at least broadly distributed to where your users might need access to that platform. Traditional remote access solutions just can't do all of these requirements. In fact, you need a SASE model to really deliver uh, all of those capabilities that we just discussed. If we tried to create an, an agent-based application that did everything that was on the last slide page, it would be a really heavy app that would take uh, its toll on the endpoint. 
but SASE delivers these capabilities in the cloud. So we don't have to worry about processing power on the endpoint. We essentially have a very light application that's just encrypting, encrypting all the traffic, sending it to the nearest uh, remote access cloud access point. And that's where all the intelligence is happening. That's where all the processing is happening. Again, off of your endpoint in the cloud, but within a, but within a very close geographic proximity. So we're not in introducing delay and a poor user experience. Now, because we're doing it in the cloud, we have some other benefits. Deployment is a breeze. Like I said, it's a very light application that you can put out on a desktop and users can put it on their personal desktops. You know, you just need to, to, to work out the strategy so you're not monitoring their personal traffic, but that's relatively easy to do. Uh, scaling across a large organization is very easy and the policy can be managed from a central location and a central dashboard and you can take advantage of some integrations like like leveraging your Active Directory user groups for example. Now there's a great opportunity to deploy a SASE based remote access strategy to enhance your remote office environment. So at a very high level remote workers people working from their homes or from a hotel are pretty similar to, to a few employees getting together in a small office uh, working in that environment. There's no need for a complicated security stack or VPN backhaul if they have a SASE based remote access strategy. Now there are some considerations that have to be made. Are there other resources within that small office that might be network connected? So you may need an SD-WAN strategy in that small office. But if it's just a bunch of individual users, maybe accessing a local, uh, a local printer, then using a SASE remote access strategy is actually as effective as, as bringing in a security stack and a heck of a lot less expensive and a heck of a lot less to maintain. Let's bring the conversation back to SD-WAN in conjunction with remote access. So as I've mentioned before, the merger of or overlap of SD-WAN and remote access is underway. Will they ever com combine completely? Yeah, I think so. It might take another five years for that type of functionality to, to be available. And there might be uh, continued overlap in functionality and that might create gaps. So we have to be aware of that. Uh, we're also seeing just right now within the COVID environment, people deploying small home devices to engage in an SD-WAN strategy for their home-based workers. Now, this has some, uh, some pros and cons in terms of privacy and in terms of application priority. Is your Zoom call gonna take priority over your kids virtual learning? And some of those decisions have to be worked out within the organization, but it is happening and it is available. From a buying perspective moving forward, I would consider your remote access and SD-WAN purchase as integrated because they will over time combine. You want to have a single provider for both of those services so that integration and that overlap uh, is easily transitioned and the interoperability between those two platforms is maintained over time. So that's my recommendation in terms of um, a buying strategy. Now here is just a quick logo sheet on the SASE providers that we have in our portfolio. Happy to discuss anyone uh, on this list or even anyone off this list because this is just a partial list of our portfolio actually. And for, in terms of next steps, if you want to continue this conversation, I have my contact information in the description of this video. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to uh, chat with you about anything that's going on with SASE Remote Access or SD-WAN in your organization. And if you got some value out of this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, a like, and thank you very much for doing that in advance. And if you wanna find your way back to this channel, the best way of doing that is by hitting that subscribe button. That will put my videos in your feed and you can find your way back here at your convenience. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day.